It's a great honor to uh, be here, and uh, I want to just be completely honest about having three affiliations in Boston. The truth of the matter is that sometimes when you move from one place to another, they never take your web page down and they never close your email. Consequently, I seem to be affiliated really long term with both Tufts and Harvard and Mass General, uh, but truly, I'm actually at Boston uh, University. Um, but I uh, really feel that uh, the topic uh, that I've been given today is a wonderful opportunity to really ask the hard questions, many of which will be tackled during this conference by the presenters, the oral presenters and the uh, poster presenters, that when we look back, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, we've come a long way, but now for the patient, translating what we know, is it harder or easier? And we might keep that in mind as we go through the conference. So I'm going to cover my interpretation of translational microbiome science. And Greg is right, you're either at a microbiome conference or you're at a probiotic fecal transplant conference, and they rarely truly come together, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we'll talk about big picture in terms of what we know with a focus on what does this mean for the patient. Then I will focus on what I think we still need to know uh, to move us forward. Then I'd like to take a sidestep into the dastardly world of regulation of products that could impact the microbiome. They're really quite challenging uh, issues that we have to deal with. And then what else do we need to know? So I think everybody in this room knows incredibly well that our microbiota are this entire collection of microorganisms in a specific niche. And almost everybody walking down the street also knows that we are actually uh, have more bacteria in us and on us than we have human cells. And perhaps even more disturbingly, we have a hundred times more bacterial, uh, more bacteria than he human genome. So it really raises a question that when we look at ourselves, are we people, humans, or are we bacteria? At some level, we must remain fair to our bacteria because of the importance that has recently been recognized to our health and well-being. What is challenging is what on earth are all these bacteria doing? And how does it impact our health and well-being? So stepping back for a second, if we just look at the relative explosion of knowledge about the microbiome, truthfully, the term barely existed in the 1990s. And now we're talking about four to 6,000 papers a year published on the microbiome. This is truly explosive growth. 
So why has that been possible? And part of the reason it has been possible is because there has been significant funding for microbiome research, particularly in the United States by the NIH, which is responsible for about 60% of the human microbiome research. However, there is a significant uh, component from uh, US MetaHIT, uh, sorry, EU MetaHIT, the Canadian Microbiome Initiative, and others, totaling through two, uh, 2012, $290 million. So a huge amount of money has been invested in trying to understand the human microbiome. <coughs> of note, probably the total investment in the microbiome, human and non-human, is probably about three to four times this amount. And this is also of relevance to the study of the human microbiome because the techniques can be uh, adapted for the study of the human microbiome. So now I think we can see why it has been possible that there has been such an explosion of uh, publications. But another huge difference is that over time, our ability to actually understand the DNA in the uh, microbiome has improved dramatically. And this slide, uh, dating back to 2012, actually shows Moore's law, which is basically that every two years, uh, your computer power increases or doubles. Um, and what this is showing is Moore's law applied to the microbiome, showing that the cost of analyzing and sequencing the uh, microbiome has been cut in half about every two years. So this dramatic reduction in cost has also enabled human microbiome science to move forward. So what has really moved the microbiome uh, resolution, uh, evolution, excuse me, is faster, cheaper DNA sequencing. And as we all know in this room, we are no longer talking about culturing bacteria. If we were, we would be done by 2 o'clock today. But now we can get a handle on the 98% of uh, bacteria in us or on us that are not uh, culturable. Initially, everybody used 16S ribosomal RNA to represent our communities. Now we're using metagenomic uh, sequencing which not only looks at the bugs that are there, but what they can do because we are understanding their genetic potential. And more recently, metagenomic transcriptomics, basically figuring out what genes are actually being transcribed, telling us more about what the bugs are actively producing but not necessarily what they are actively doing yet. And the other revolution is the bioinformatics revolution, which has enabled faster and cheaper computational analyses. All of these things have come together to help us understand the following, what we know. We know more about the gut microbiome, and that's mostly based on fecal samples than any other anatomic site. And just looking at publications, um, this was reviewed in a, a, a genome uh, publication last year. Clearly, we have about 60% of all publications dedicated to the gut microbiome. 
So mostly when we're talking about the microbiome, we're focusing on the gut. But that clearly isn't the whole story. We also know that changing the microbiome is possible in certain circumstances. We are very familiar with the fact that antibiotics can dramatically change the microbiome. So it is possible to change one's microbiome. And this isn't always a good thing. In fact, it usually isn't. We also know that the microbiome in health and disease is different. And one of the challenges has been, what the heck do we mean by health? And that has typically been defined as no disease known at this particular time. So these are things we do know. We also know that the gut microbiome varies by age and geography based on this uh, extremely well-known paper published in uh, Nature in 2012, looking at about 500 family members in three countries over different age ranges. And the red are from Malawi in sub-Saharan Africa. The uh, green are Amerindians and the blue are the USA. And it's very clear that in the first three years of life, there is a very, very different pattern than after three years old. Everybody in this room is over three years old. It's all over. It's all downhill from now on. Or at least there's a really solid, uh, stable uh, microbiome for a long period of time. But we also know that uh, the Amerindians and the US population are different as well. So it does raise questions as to why, and it raises opportunities when we think about, can we change the microbiome? This slide is challenging because it suggests the microbiome is stable, so it may be hard to change. But it does raise questions about whether diet or environment or other factors will permit us to change our own microbiome. This is also extremely well known in healthy uh, individuals. And the concept here is that the bacteria that are around in our various sites are quite different. And this pattern is fairly standard across a wide range of populations. So our microbiome in the gut is clearly different from the skin and the oral uh, cavity. And we almost never even think about this when we're thinking about patient therapeutics. And this might be um, something we might want to think about in the future. We also know that between human diversity is greater than within human diversity. Basically meaning we are more like ourselves than anybody else. And surprisingly, everybody, every one of us is unique, including identical twins, often do not have identical microbiomes. And as we mentioned, after age three, the human microbiome is relatively stable. Thinking about this in terms of translating what we know into therapeutics, this is scary. Everybody's different. Everybody is more like themselves. How on earth are we going to make therapeutic advances that we can understand and get predictable results? This is also very well known. This is looking at uh, the phyla in the various locations um, 
of uh, the body where the microbiome has been studied. And it's very clear that in the nose, there is a very different pattern from the stool. You can see all the blue of the bacteroidities um, in the stool that are virtually absent in the nares. But what is equally interesting is that if we look at the metabolic profile of the, um, of the ge bacterial genomes in these various places, they're relatively consistent, despite the fact the organisms are so different. Again, what are the implications of this when we think about therapies for patients? And so now I'd like to step back and put my spin on where I think we are when we're talking about what used to be a holy grail. Let's just give everybody a nice, healthy microbiome. Maybe that is a concept that doesn't mean that much because there is so much that is unique to each of us we cannot come up with a single microbiome that defines a healthy person. You've probably all heard about the discussion of keystone species within the microbiome. These are supposed to be organisms that are much more influential than their abundance suggests and their function may not yet have been recognized. But it is believed that there are certain bacteria that are more important than others in a healthy microbiome. And whether or not they're the keys to restoring a healthy microbiome, that is unknown. What is generally accepted at this time is there is a core of microbial gene combinations that perform a core set of functions which do things in each location where those bacteria are that make sure the immune system is mature and maintains homeostasis maintains mucosal barrier functions and potentially neurotransmitter functions, digestion, epigenetic uh, regulation, etc. So it seems that there are a core group of functions that can be supported by a large number of organisms. Now, as we try and think about therapeutics, we now are not just thinking about lobbing in a few bacteria. We're thinking about preserving core function. And I think that's quite a change over the last 10 years. So now let me push on with things that I think we don't know as well. And I'm absolutely delighted we have so many presentations addressing these issues. This shows this conference is moving the field forward because we are now doing something very scary. We're going beyond the gut uh, to understand the microbiome outside the gut representative, which is a fecal sample. Everything I've said so far is hopeless. I kept talking just about bacteria. That's wrong. There are clearly fungi and who knows what else we're going to find um, in uh, the future. But we cannot just think about the microbiome in terms of bacteria. So the non-bacterial microbiome may be incredibly influential, and we barely scratch the surface of that. 
We also don't know too much about the local effects of the microbiome versus the distant effects. There are some very exciting discussions now focusing on how we could treat the gut and solve problems in the brain. But how do we even think about translating what we know and what we don't know so that we can make incredibly exciting advances for uh, diseases of the brain which have been very difficult to treat? We still have some technical uh, challenges, and we're going to discuss some of these today as well. There are still challenges about the best way to collect, process, and analyze specimens. And there are still challenges relating to significant protocol variability. We also know way less than perhaps we should although I know we're going to hear one very interesting talk today about uh, spatial relationships in these microbial communities. Mostly, we homogenize stool and destroy every piece of spatial information we possibly could. There may be an awful lot we have to learn there before we jump into therapeutics. And we still have unclassifiable sequences in our DNA. And we don't always know what they're doing. And in fact, we don't even always report the percentage of unclassifiable uh, sequences in uh, papers. Then, if we want to translate what we are observing i.e. we're not intervening with people, into therapeutics. What are we going to do about the fact everybody is an individual? Do we know enough about what is cause and what is effect, i.e. which came first? Did the microbiome change? and then the disease appear, or did the disease appear, and the microbiome changed? We haven't got an answer for that yet. I would submit that this remains a significant question. Can we change the microbiome in a safe and predictable way such that we can actually translate therapies? Uh, in, into therapies for patients? And how do we deal with the regulatory world? This is a very new area for regulators, and the challenges are significant, because if the, mis if the wrong decisions are made, there could be serious consequences. And then, the thing we often bury our head in the sand about, but I know there are talks about this at this very uh, conference, are whether or not everything we want to achieve with a microbiome therapy could be completely ruined because you went to McDonald's for lunch. We just don't know. So now I'd like to move on to what I'm calling microbiome therapeutics. This isn't a term I made up, but I've, I've seen it. And what I'm particularly talking about is any therapy that could alter our microbiome. Probiotics and prebiotics have been around for centuries, and they are anticipated to be a $45 billion global market in 2018, and that one is not going to be shrinking. Over the last five to 10 years, there's been increased investment in microbiome science by the pharmaceutical industry, venture capital, uh, and uh, the food industry. And microbiome biotechs are getting products 
closer to market. So clearly there are therapies out there that are already in existence or getting close to market. And then what changed everything about four or five years ago, although actually it really wasn't four or five years ago that the idea of fecal transplants started. The fecal transplants have changed the regulatory framework because unlike probiotics, prebiotics, and microbiome therapeutics, these are patient-derived products, and the FDA and other regulatory authorities have taken a different view about the organisms that are present in fecal transplants and are not regulating them in the same way. And guess what? If you go on the web, you can do your own fecal transplant. Apparently, you need a blender, a turkey baster, and I think a spoon. That's it. No regulation, just happening. So guess what? I think translational and microbiome science has already met the patient. And that poses challenges for us scientifically. How do we understand fecal transplants when they are being done by patients? Do we need to? What is our obligation to people who do that? Very new and challenging questions that haven't been asked before. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the regulatory challenges that I've been through and sprinkle it with a little uh, microbiome science as well. I consider myself a translational microbiome researcher because I am interested in trying to modify the microbiome. What I actually want to modify the microbiome to do, and this was my incredibly simplistic idea in the early uh, 2000s, was basically to have a nice wall of all these wonderful beneficial bacteria that just went to methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, vanco-resistant uh, enterococci, and ESBL-producing uh, Klebsiella and pneumoniae. We just needed them out of there. And so we just needed that nice, beneficial uh, microbiome that would protect us against these horribly antibiotic-resistant organisms. Well, 17 years later, not so easy. A very simplistic idea that hasn't worked. So let me tell you a little bit about the regulatory landscape in uh, the US. And I know there are some similarities with uh, Europe, Canada, uh, Japan. There are also some significant uh, variations. Uh, but truthfully, I think the US regulatory scene is one of the harder ones. And this may have impact as microbiome therapeutics are developed. First of all, in the early 2000s, probiotics were barely regulated by the FDA. If they were regulated, they were regulated by the drugs, the uh, Center for Drug Evaluation and uh, Research. And they had a very different attitude to the use of probiotics in human studies than where probiotics are right now. They're regulated by the Center for Biologic uh, Evaluation and Research. And CBA probably has the most strict requirements for manufacturing and study design relating to the products that it regulates. They have been requiring these 
first in man studies. In healthy individuals, even for probiotics that have been around for 20 to 30 years. And the rationale for this is that despite the fact there are thousands of papers written on many of these common probiotics, they state that they do not know whether or not the product was of adequate or sufficient quality for people to conclude that use of that particular probiotic was safe. And so it doesn't matter where we've been before in terms of studies that need to be regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. We have to start with first in man studies in healthy individuals. And to make it harder, there are strict manufacturing requirements that are almost impossible for food companies to achieve because this is just not the way food products are made. And if a food company is willing to uh, work with the FDA, they have to achieve and maintain and be willing to undergo inspections to make sure that their drug master file, which is the whole manufacturing, chemistry, and controls uh, process for the probiotic or whatever, um, is meeting FDA standards. I'm sure you won't be surprised to know that there are a limited number of probiotics in the United States that have a drug master file. I don't know what the exact number is, but it's definitely in the single digits. That means if you actually want to do a study of probiotics in the US and you are required by your institutional review board to contact the FDA, it's all over unless you are studying um, a probiotic that already has a drug master file. So I naively put in four grants to NIH, got them funded, and then, the F, uh, then NIH said, before uh, we release uh, the funds, just make a quick call to the FDA and make sure they don't require you to get an IND. This was in 2003. At the other end of the phone, what? Are you mad? No, you are not doing any of those four studies. Come back when you found a company that will uh, form a drug master file for your probiotic. Then we'll talk. Let me tick forward to 2009, working on this every day in the interim. We finally managed to work with a food company to get a drug master file. And then the FDA said, ha! Now you're ready to do your first in man studies. First in man. The probiotic I was working with is probably taken by about five million people a day and has been since the mid 90s. This is uh, the probiotic Lactobacillus uh, GG. I think it's a pretty well known probiotic. So, anyway. I was told I had to do a limited randomized trial of this particular probiotic in 50 healthy adults, young people, because it was too scary to think about older people. And I really hate the fact 50 is older. <laughs> it used to be fine, it's just not anymore. Um, and they also wanted long-term follow-up, and I'll show you what that meant. And then they wanted me to do what they called an open label study where everybody gets a probiotic 
in 15 healthy elderly subjects, 65 to 80. To me, the scary thing is even 80 is not sounding that old anymore. And then they would be willing to reconsider the remaining research. By the way, this is where I am in 2017. It's been a long journey. So let me just tell you quickly about the phase one uh, randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial in 50 healthy elderly. We did what we call a uh, four to one randomization because we wanted to learn much more about the people who took the probiotic than the people who ended up taking uh, placebo. The dose was uh, two capsules a day and there were matching placebo that were given twice a day. We got information at baseline, including stool, oropharyngeal, and nasopharyngeal uh, samples for microbiome work. And then the subjects took either the probiotic or placebo for six months. We followed them off study drug for one more month. And then the FDA said, oh goodness, what might happen after month seven? And we actually had to go out to month 12. But we did have the opportunity of getting multiple uh, specimens for microbiome analysis. Who were these healthy subjects? How did we know they were healthy? Well, first of all, they had to have no medical diagnoses. They couldn't uh, get uh, pregnant either uh, as a woman or uh, make a woman uh, pregnant because uh, the FDA was worried about uh, the lactobacillus GG in that circumstance. We needed them off yogurt and other probiotic products for the entire year. We couldn't have them on any prescriptions. They had to have a normal physical exam, normal lab tests. And yes, we tested everybody for HIV, Hep B, Hep C, and we did urine toxicology. We really went a long way to show that these subjects were healthy. And what we did learn in these 39 of the 50 patients who took the LGG, so we didn't know who they were during the study, we learned something very disturbing. Only six of them were compliant with the protocol. How did we know that? In real time, we did capsule counts. Fat lot of good they are. Complete waste of time. We also did LGG culture, but of course, I couldn't get the results of that during the study because I would have then been potentially unblinded. So we actually cultured the school for the organism, and we also used PCR on the uh, stool. And we eventually, in the 16S analysis, we were actually able to show that LGG uh, was transcribed in six of these 39 patients. And we could pick it up at month one, month three, and then at 12 months, not surprisingly, it had all gone. So the gray is no LGG transcripts, yellow going through to orange and red are more and more LGG transcripts. And what was remarkable is each of these circles represents an individual patient, and there was a heck of a lot of concordance across the patients with what genes in the LGG were transcribed. That definitely surprised us, but the compliance rate shocked us. And the reason this is terribly important is that if we are doing studies of microbiome therapeutics and we're analyzing the data and we don't know whether or not the patients were compliant, we could be chasing completely irrelevant information. 
I'm going to skip over some of the uh, details because the second study shows almost the same thing. But what we did find was that in the patients receiving LGG, there was a different pattern of butyrate producing species, particularly Rosa burea, in the LGG group who were compliant versus the placebo group. I didn't worry about compliance in the placebo group because they weren't taking uh, the LGG. But if we had included every single person in this analysis, the data would be completely meaningless. And I'm going to skip over those because we're going to see a very similar pattern in the second study, which was an open label study in 15 healthy elderly. This time, LGG was only administered for one month, and we had multiple specimens again, stool, nasopharynx, and uh, oropharyngeal uh, specimens. The FDA was terribly focused on safety, as they were in the younger cohort. Um, but I just want to warn you, if you're ever doing a study in healthy elderly, one of the challenges is if you give them a diary and ask them to record on a daily basis any symptom they have, please prepare for the need for bioinformatics to analyze them. They write and write and write. They are so detailed. And in fact, when we took the diaries away, several of our patients actually asked if they could just continue <laughs> reporting on their symptoms. They were an incredible group. But even in these very motivated, healthy, elderly subjects, we were actually only able to show that 12 of them, now this is 12 out of 15, were compliant using the same analysis that we uh, saw previously. And what we also saw in these healthy elderly was that once they were taking the LGG, there was an increase in... Um, butyrate production, particularly from Rosaburia. And interestingly, both in our younger cohort and our older cohort, we actually found that there was a reduction in the inflammatory uh, cytokine, the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-8, which kind of makes sense. And I was really surprised about that. Honestly, I was not expecting an effect in healthy elderly subjects. And here are our data that showed us exactly who the people were who took the LGG and those who did not. And these are our data also from uh, the uh, publication uh, that came out in uh, 2015. So what have I learned about micro, uh, microbiome therapeutics over a period of almost 14 years? It is a challenging regulatory environment. FMTs are, uh, do take a different regulatory approach. There is a patient-driven option for microbiome therapeutics based on fecal transplants uh, following uh, instructions on YouTube. And that if we are going to study microbiome therapeutics and we do not observe uh, the therapies actually being taken, we could get severely misled by our conclusions. So now the question is, what else do we need to know? I still think we need to understand the mechanisms by which the microbiome can potentially be manipulated 
to achieve health. We need to know whether or not novel and synthetic microbiomes, uh, micro microbes can be engineered so that a microbiome can move towards health. We need to understand whether a concept of personalized or precision nutrition is realistic and can achieve the desired outcome. And then a plea from a global health perspective how could those in resource poor settings who get exposed to so many rounds of antibiotics because diagnoses cannot be made properly, particularly in young kids whose developing microbiome often gets destroyed by these repeated antibiotics, how could we possibly ensure that we can help uh, these young children? And so I'd like to uh, finish up by just showing what I think are some really cool cartoons on the web. Uh, clearly, I think all of us here understand that uh, not all bugs are bad. We are in the minority. That really isn't fair. And I hope what we can do in this conference is think about changing no to yes for microbiome therapeutics and for addressing those areas that are challenging all of us right now. And as Gregor said, this is a welcome to our conference and I can't wait for us to talk about new solutions. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm struck by the lack of compliance. That's extraordinary. I was wondering if uh, in the younger group, because the older group seemed to be better at it, at complying, in the younger group, uh, did you do a positive control where you observed uh, people taking a particular, taking the therapeutic and then assay them. I was just wondering if there was any other possible explanation for a negative finding of lactobacillus in the stools. So uh, th that's a great question. I'll actually tell you what our uh, nauseating protocol was. Um, when we uh, screened the study subjects to make sure they were healthy, and I'm sure you can understand that took some time because we were checking HIV and Hep B, Hep C, and, uh, as well as uh, a lot of other uh, lab tests. Um, we were counseling people as to what it would mean to be in the study and that we really needed people to take their medicine on a daily basis and report to us using a daily diary what uh, their various uh, experiences were. When they actually came in and were shown to meet the uh, inclusion criteria for the study, we actually had the pharmacist bring up the randomized uh, product. As I said, we didn't know whether it was LGG or placebo in our younger uh, group. And the first tablet was observed, and we actually got um, uh, some symptoms that people initially had uh, as they uh, went through that observation uh, period. Um, what we could have done, but did not do, was ask them to come back over the next few days and uh, actually give us stool specimens. So that would have uh, actually answered uh, some of the uh, uh, question that you're asking. Then we called them on day three, day seven, day 14, day 21, and then they came back on day 28, and if they didn't come back on day 28, we called them and reminded them to come back, and we asked them to bring in their diary and their capsules, and da, 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 da. So we really asked them to be as compliant as possible, and it was shocking to us that we had such poor results. When we counted their capsules, these were smart people. I don't know what they were doing, but I think uh, quite a few of them ended up not here. So should one do 
directly observed therapy. I mean, some of the thera microbiome therapeutics that are being developed right now are being done as directly observed uh, therapies. And, uh, you know, certainly for novel therapies for C. diff, those are being done as observed uh, therapies. But this was a huge cautionary tale to me that it, it was really likely that a healthy, younger population probably couldn't care less about whether or not they were compliant. I don't know if that will translate to a population that has clinical illness who may feel that they could benefit uh, from the probiotics. But what I do know is that if we're trying to understand mechanisms, we really need to take that into account. Does that seem fair? Yeah. Thank you. So, so I had to follow up on that. And what was your detection limit? I'm so sorry? What was the detection limit for detecting the, the, the lactobacillus? Um, I know there were three different uh, detection limits. Um, certainly for regular culture, we had to have live organisms or else we couldn't culture. And there is a limit, and I actually forget exactly what it is. It's a slightly different limit for PCR and it's a slightly different limit uh, for the 16S analysis. And what we did was, it, you know, Typically, what we would find is the huge differences in the bars. So there were a whole bunch of people who were very, very positive all the way through. And there were very few people who uh, gave us uh, differing results depending on the methodology. But we did have some people who we couldn't get live organisms out of, um, which suggests to me that the LGG was, was dead. But I can't, I can't tell you exact uh, number. Well, if, if there's 10 to 14 bacteria in your gut and you're giving a person 10 to 10 a day, you have to, at, if, if nothing happens to that bacteria, your detection limit has to be at least 10, uh, one in 1,000 because, because they're actually there at, at one in 10,000. So if you, if, you're not, if, you don't have a, if you have a detection limit below one in 10,000, uh, if nothing happens to the bacteria at all, then you're not going to find it. So, so, I mean, if I, if I knew the detection limit was one in 10,000, and I knew that at least some of them were going to die, I'd want a detection limit of one in a million. And, and, yeah. I, and I suspect, uh, well, I, I would uh, count you to go back and check what your detection limit is, because it, it could be that they're there all along and, you, and you've missed them because you, you haven't actually uh, calculated detection limit and designed your detection protocol accordingly. I, I think that's fair, um, but I do think there were almost two categories of people that were certainly some that I would say were pers persistently below detection limits, some very, very low. And then of the people we analyzed, they were significantly positive, you know, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, to 10 to the 10. But I, I hear you. And honestly, I wasn't expecting this to be so much of an issue. Uh, so I realize, in retrospect, that was something we should have paid more attention to in the uh, design of the protocol. But you're, it, you're, be, you're right. It'd be good to sit down with the back of a, uh, an envelope afterwards and, and calculate it. Because yeah. uh, you, 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 it could be you could go back to your samples yeah. and, 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 uh, and redeem some of these, these characters. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. I, I think that's very fair. So my question is, is really more on the baseline microbiome. So you guys monitored the starting microbiota. Um, were there any associations there with who you later detected LGG in, either in, in the healthy cohort or in the elderly? Um, you know, diversity differences or specific microbes that were present that were preventing the colonization? That is a great question, and we actually have not done that. Part of the reason we hadn't been exploring that was at some level, I think we'd felt that the, this particular population were moderately homogeneous because they, were, they had so many markers of, quotes health. Um, but I think that's actually a great idea to see if there were people who maybe were more resistant to uh, you know, having the LGG detected in the stool. I have actually done LGG studies where we cultured only the 
the LGG previously, and we typically found uh, that in patients, this was an era before the FDA got too involved in uh, uh, the regulation of uh, probiotics, that uh, it was fairly easy to recover the LGG, but only for a few days. So after about two days after stopping LGG, it's all gone. Uh, but typically, uh, in patients, we were finding much higher levels. But that's a great thought, and I have not done that. So thank you for that. Um, I'm just amazed at just how restrictive the FDA are, so it's a huge limitation on the research you can do. So I was wondering, could you engage with like a citizen science approach if five million people are taking LGG? You won't have like a perfect experimental design or serology or anything like that, but you might have groups of people that have taken specific probiotics, not taking them. You'll have a broad spectrum of people, and you could at least look how it might be affecting the microbiome or broad differences in the microbiome between individuals. Would that be possible, do you think? You know, that's a great question. Gregor, I think you, you've seen uh, the way the FDA has been approaching uh, this. Um, th this isn't fiction, right? <laughs> um, but it really raises the question, are there ways to move science forward? Because at some level, the control isn't with us, at least for fecal transplants. and you know, maybe this is time for us to think about different ways to work with uh, patient uh, populations. Um, I think it would require some significant uh, thought about the best way to handle this, and clearly you always worry you've got to buy a subset, but heck, the people who landed up in our trials how biased were they, for goodness sake, because of all the things we had to put them through. So I kind of like the idea of thinking about novel ways that uh, we could uh, collaborate with patients. There are some significant challenges with IRBs as well in terms of what we uh, can and cannot do. But if people are already taking something that the FDA says should be under IND, it, it's a tricky issue for the IRBs, at least in the US, to deal with. And I'm not sure uh, that they've quite figured out the best way forward yet. But that's a very interesting question. Thank you. We've got another one down here. Yes, yeah, I'm um, sorry. The, the, best ah, way, the best yeah. way to deal with Americans is to um, do a study in another country and then, and then say to Americans, this has an effect on colon cancer, but it's only available in Finland. <laughs> You'll see them wanting that product pretty quick. Okay, here. Um, thank you for your interesting talk. I got so one comment, uh, or two comments. One is that I'm affiliated with the MHRA in the UK, which is a regulatory agency, and they regard, for instance, FMT as a borderline medicine. And I can tell you, as soon as the link between the patient and the donor of FMT is broken by a manufacturer or by physically being in a different building, or then it becomes a medicine, and then it becomes much more tricky. And then you have to have a license as one yeah. of the producers of the product. I'm not sure about clinical trials, because they have a clinical <coughs> trials unit in the MHRA, which would do the same as the FDA uh, yeah. looked at your trial. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure if they are that strict, but obviously when you claim to have a med medicinal effect or something like it, you are on the same scrutiny as any other medicine. Yeah. This is for the UK audience, really. Um, then another uh, point I'd like to ask your view about. There's been this trial in India with uh, another Lactobacillus uh, planetarium, I think, in young children, and they showed that the incidence of sepsis was much lower. So what do you think about those findings? Are they... Um, and uh, do you think it sort of can be explained from your uh, study with IL-8 and with that sort of view, or do you think it's a, is it a useful way forward, this sort of approach? So that's a great question. Uh, the uh, author of that study, I don't believe that was done under IND. It was funded by NIH, but a different institute. 
and there's a huge amount of variability across the NIH institutes about which do and do not require uh, FDA regulation. And I believe that study was not done under IND. So I'm pretty sure SIBA's interpretation of that uh, paper would have been that uh, this is impossible to interpret, but the results were pretty compelling. I mean, that was a study that was stopped early as well by the Data and Safety uh, Monitoring Board. I think it's very promising. Um, neonatal sepsis is a really tough diagnosis uh, to make. I think it would be one of those studies I would really like to see a repeat on because to just put a huge number of kids on lactobacillus in resource poor settings is quite a scary concept. I'm also concerned that, uh, you know, right now we don't even know the relationship between the various lactobacilli and whether or not you would expect uh, similar effects. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that study was not done under IND. I'll try and check that out uh, while I'm here and get an answer to that specific uh, question. Thank you. Thank you for a great overview. So uh, I guess I have a little bit more question about the immunology. So you mentioned the IL-8. Was this in the mucosal uh, secretions or was this, uh, you know, where was this IL-8? Uh, IL oh, it was, um, it was uh, plasma IL-8, uh, so systemic. So systemic IL-8. So and and uh, luminex assay. Yeah, so I was just curious whether other uh, parameters for immune modulation were measured as well. The reason why I'm asking is because IL-8 is actually a chemokine. Yes. And, uh, you know, it basically drives T cells to homing at mucosal sites. Yes. So if the IL-8 is decreasing in people who are taking lactobacillus, is that good or is that bad? Good question. In normal, healthy people. Yeah, so you know, I should don't know. we be decreasing because the T cells are in the intestine for a reason? Yes, 5% yes. of activated T cells are basically surveying right. intestinal. So, uh, you know, so that would be the readouts. It's great that it's colonized. Yes. But the outcomes should be just more than looking systemic. Yes, totally agree with you. Truthfully, that was kind of an add-on uh, yeah. study just to try and push our understanding of mechanisms a little bit further. Because honestly, I just didn't know what to expect with normal healthy subjects. I was honestly expecting nothing. I was also very concerned that our N for our uh, phase one study was relatively small. Even if you take the 50 subjects, including all those non-compliant people, it's still a terribly small M. And we did do a panel of chemokines and cytokines. And then you've got multiple comparisons, et cetera. I did find the same result in uh, the elderly, uh, the healthy elderly and the healthy young. But like you, I'm concerned. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? And just because we've got an effect in a, a population that doesn't make a lot of sense and doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that this is uh, a safe or appropriate thing to do. This is why I think we really do need to think through a lot more carefully how we are potentially manipulating the microbiome. I think these are great questions. The reason we didn't get a lot more sophisticated markers was because we already had quite a lot of blood draws. The FDA required us to check um, a huge panel of safety markers every single visit, and we just didn't feel that, you know, we wanted to do, um, you know, PMBCs or, or whatever, uh, which would have uh, added quite significantly to the blood volume. So we weren't able to do everything, but again, a great question. <laughs>